Thank you, Pierre. Hello, everyone. Um, 34.5 in here at the moment. And I have to have the windows shut because it's too noisy otherwise. Um, so yeah, uh, slightly warmer than some of you, slightly cooler than some of you. But thanks for having me. I've, I've no idea why any of you came to this. Um, but it's lo lovely to see some people here. And I know, I know a few people in the Agile community, obviously know Pierre. We met at a thing that I think Tobias ran a few years ago, didn't we? Something, something. Yeah, it's doing Tobias workshop in London. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it was, I had one of those moments that I looked, I've been looking forward to this, and I thought I better check what I suggested we call this session. And I looked and noticed it was called The Art of Not Knowing. Uh, and part of that is because I am um, very interested in not knowing. Um, I find it really difficult to describe what I do, so I'll talk a bit about that in a minute. But generally, generally, I'm interested in creativity in the human condition, is how I describe it. Um, and that pretty much covers every single aspect of life, I think. But creativity in the human condition, creativity being that human endeavor towards the novel, the different, the, the spectacular, um, and the human condition being that compulsion to move away from the unfamiliar. And it causes this tension in this, the entire time. And it tends to be because the way we're educated and brought up in the way society works is the human condition always wins out and we stifle our own creativity not for everyone but but for a lot of us um, and for me the the art of not knowing sits at the heart of really striking that balance uh, but the main honest reason why I, I suggest we call this the art of not knowing is because when Pierre and I spoke about this in must have been June maybe even May I don't know the week the weeks and months have just gone weird haven't they yeah me me i guess yeah um i thought i don't know what i'm going to talk about so let's call it the art of not knowing um so i, I sort of have a vague plan i have a vague idea i thought we'd i thought we'd do a quick experiment then i'd talk for a bit and then we can have some conversation and see where you want to take this um we may just end up Having conversations, we may end up doing more experiments. I've, I've no idea. My only question, Pierre, was what time is this scheduled to finish? How long is the session? Um, I'm a lazy bastard. So, meaning I give you two hours. And if you want to uh, stop earlier, you stop earlier. And that's okay. If you make longer, you can make longer. Yeah. So, I you. Think, I think I can survive two hours without oxygen in here. So, it won't be longer than that. Mm. Um, I, I had an idea that we might do some drawing together, but I noticed that not everyone is is on video. Um, so let's do something different. Um, this is going to be deliberately vague, with no further instructions than this. Yeah, in a moment, can we put everyone in pairs? Um, maybe you. No, you, you go as well, and you can leave me. That will be pairs of eighteen. Uh, any... In breakout rooms. Yeah, in breakout rooms, everyone in pairs randomly. Yeah, sure. All I want you to do is to spend two minutes in silence with each other. Hmm. And then after two minutes, you can all come back. There's nothing more to it than that. I don't know if that's easier or not if you're not on video, but if you have a video and switch it on, then it'll bring a different level of intensity to it. So if we could do that just for two minutes, I'll, um, I don't know, can I do a broadcast to let everyone know when to come back? Yes, uh, uh, we'll be here, and they will come automatically. The yeah, system perfect. will close automatically. Perfect. You can see how great I am at technology. So yeah, going to you're going to be in a room with a random person. I'd just like you to spend two minutes in silence with each other, and then come back. We'll see how that works. Okay. Not talking just, at all. Just the instructions. I'd just spend two minutes in silence with each other. Enjoy. One, two, silence. three. Oh, that was my best bit and you've missed it now. <laughs> um, so I'm just interested from everyone, how was that? But with what I've just said in that domain of what were you thinking, what were you feeling, what were you noticing, whatever it was, whether it was, this is nice, whether it was, I feel fluttery, whether it was, my God, is it going to be just this for two hours? Just hear from a couple of people, what did you notice? Uh, for me, it was like, uh, let the mask down. Okay. Okay, nice. And how was that? How did that make you feel? How was that? Well, I, I'm quite uh, used to that, to that ex kind of exercise, but it, I felt it. Yeah. Just, just be, and that's it. Okay, that's don't good. don't roll to play. Nothing to be uh, too much or not, etc. Nothing. Yeah. Lovely. Thank you.
Anything else? Um, I didn't feel comfortable. It was like wet because the car was on. So I was just uh, trying, I was um, um, watching, crossing off his eyes and turning my eyes. Um, because maybe I use it to speak to, to at times maybe we talk to hide this word and this feeling uncomfortable with people we don't know. And and I I feel like the two minutes are more than fifteen. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean this is a facet I I'll talk a bit more about silence in a minute, but this is it's one of the most potent and powerful things and um we sort of underestimate what it can do because it's so simple. Yes, thank you. Let's hear let's hear one more. Frederic, who's at thirty eight degrees. Thank you. I was trying to continue the exercise. <laughs> <laughs> um so it, it felt very different than in person uh, because i i i feel in person you you look at the eyes of uh, another person and you feel um figuratively naked and uh, vulnerable and here i was struggling between uh connecting looking at the camera to make myself um available and um looking at uh, my partner yeah. and so it, it was a very different uh intermediated experience do, yeah. do you see what i mean yeah yeah so your so living experience of it was different to if it were face to face yeah yeah and and no, no, let's hear, let's hear a couple more because this is fascinating it starts to unravel some stuff we might explore further it was nice to slow down and uh, stop the rush, rush, rush and the zipping thoughts to just be present. Yeah. Maybe one thing that popped into my mind, um, like we, we went to this room without any intentions and we didn't want anything. So I had to laugh and I realized that it was a very friendly um, surrounding. So yeah. if you don't want anything, the basic human intention is positive. Yeah. Positive. And this is something that popped up into my mind because very often I go into meetings and I want something and I see some faces and they don't laugh all the time. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's, that's lovely because it brings, um, it sort of builds on what others have just said there, that if we take away structure, humans will imagine structure or will imagine objective or imagine right or wrong because we're so we're so used to it and what i heard you describing there um is it karina is that pronounced right what i heard you describing there was a sort of liberation from it having to be anything other than what it was um and i've, I've experimented with silence a lot and i did a big online silent gathering it's about 70 people came along to it and what was interested is most of people's worries were whether they were doing it right or not um, and the majority of people engaged in it in a very solemn way, like, okay, this is this is obviously very deep and meaningful, and it can be. Um, and then we would, we did a debrief a week later, so we didn't want to retreat to words. We did a debrief a week later, and someone said, "Oh, I felt really bad because I was I was laughing and giggling." And then the other person started laughing and giggling, and they they felt like the naughty child uh, children at school. And then everyone just said, "Well, but no one said you can't do that." There was this sort of implication, this imagined standard of what adult silence was like, and it was bizarre. And it's what I find with a lot of things is we we obsess a lot about structure. And it's, I'm not anti-structure, um, but if we remove structure, human beings will create something, create something novel to give us that security or that that way of navigating and getting on together. Uh, let, let's hear one more. Then I want, I'm just going to say a little bit about the type of work I do, and then we'll just leap off into some other conversations and experiments. I didn't expect to start here. Um, yeah, anything else anyone wants to add? Um, I wanted to start with an experiment because a lot of the time the subjects that I'm interested in, like um, uh, I don't particularly like the word, but disruption and change and culture change and disturbance and um, 
movement and revolution and dissonance and all of those things. People like the idea of those things, but don't like the reality of them. And there was a wise old man that I knew once that told me a Chinese proverb um, about the man who loved dragons. I don't know if you've heard it. So I, I said it at a conference a few years ago. Um, the story of the man who loved dragons goes like this. Once upon a time, there was a man who loved dragons. It could be a man or it could be a woman or it could be, it could be anyone. It doesn't really matter. Um, but this man loved dragons so much that he, um, his curtains were, had drag pictures of dragons on them. He used to wear shirts with dragons on them. He had a mouse pad with dragons on it. His screensaver had dragons on it. His phone cover had dragons on it and it would make the noise of a dragon whenever it rang. And he lived in a dragon shaped house in a lane called Dragon Lane and he lived in Wales because the Welsh flag is a dragon. Um, and the, the, this man loved dragons so much that he'd go to sleep in his dragon pajamas and he'd dream about dragons. So the Queen of Dragons heard about this um, over in her castle in Dragonland, where, wherever that is. And she said, um, I'm going to go and visit this man. He really loves dragons. This would be amazing. It would make his day. So she flew over to Wales and spotted his dragon shaped house. He flew down, knocked on the door. And the man who loved dragons opened the door. And on seeing a real dragon uh, for the first time, screamed and fled to the hills and never returned. And the Queen of Dragons was really sad about this. So she flew back to her kingdom and said to her wise friend, what, what happened? This man loves dragons and I'm really upset. He just fled. And the Queen's wise friend said, ah, this is the man that loves the idea of dragons, not dragons in reality. And I often tell that story because it's a similar thing and you'll experience it in your world of people that like the idea of something. But the reality of it is something different. And people like the idea of not knowing or the idea of playing at the edge of not knowing. But the reality of it is it's, it's quite disturbing or it, it could be quite enlightening. So I always like to start with experiments. And pretty much that's what my work is, is, is all about. I'm going to hopefully, if I can make my technology work, um, show my screen. Can you see that? Wow, I've advanced in my screen. Yes. Brilliant. Nice. So as I said before, I'm interested in creativity and the human condition. Um, and pretty much what I do is we'll suddenly come up with a question. I'm dyslexic and I'm sure I'm slightly autistic as well. So just weird things pop into my mind. And I'll think, what's an experiment that could explore that? So basically, I do stuff to see what happens and then do more stuff. Um, in fact, this was my 10 year plan I published in January this year. Um, but I take deadly seriously to do stuff, to see what happens. And as long as I'm still alive, to do more stuff. Um, and a quick advert, you can buy some limited prints of that in my shop. The originals have already sold out. Um, so these projects are all around exploring a question. So some examples of these. One of my favourite ones was way back in 2017, I think, when I thought, um, I'm a bit nervous about drawing portraits. I'm quite good at drawing. But what would happen if, um, if I confronted my fear of drawing portraits? So I came up with an experiment I called the Imperfect Portrait Experiment. And I went into London's Trafalgar Square to draw pictures of tourists or business people or anyone that went past. Um, and it was terrifying for about the first 10 minutes as people came up and then started queuing up to get these portraits, thinking that I was a professional portrait artist. But after a few minutes of the experiment, something happened is that fear started to shift and I started to find a bit of a joy in it. I mean, look at the, the look on this lady's face. You don't get that type of look normally when you hand someone a portrait. It's normally that very artsy. Ooh. Yes, it's very good. And people were finding these magnificent. And I spent the entire day in Trafalgar Square drawing these portraits of people with no objective than just to see what happened. And the interesting thing was that I started to realise that a lot of the things that I considered failures in my style were actually my style. And instead of trying to eliminate them, I just made them bigger and amplified them. And then more people wanted the portraits and then people started buying them and sell these for lots of money now. But the other thing was a number of people left thinking, well, if he can do it, maybe I can do it. Maybe the way I've been thinking about art for these years is, uh, is wrong. It doesn't have to be about anything in particular. It can just be an exploration of stuff. And the only reason I left on that day was because it was boiling hot, as you can see, and my pen's run out of ink. 2018 um, was another experiment that I did, uh, called it an expert. And this one came about from thinking, what would happen if I did the opposite of TED? Now I've got nothing against TED. I've done a TED talk myself a number of years back, 
but I noticed that in a similar way to the really stuck attitudes around art, there's some really fixed attitudes and beliefs around expertise. And there's the whole tyranny of Ted or cult of Ted, which as enlightening as it is, I think is very um, detrimental to our own learning and experimentation. It's like something's in a Ted talk, it must be true. Um, I'm the same idiot as I am as I was before my TED talk, but the fact I've done one now and people have watched it doesn't change anything. So I thought, what would happen if I did the opposite of TED? So I hired a hundred seater London theatre, um, which completely sold out, and I booked 16 speakers to give talks on subjects that they were interested in but had no expertise in whatsoever. Um, we hired, we um, had an art gallery on the way in to the into the main theatre that had bits of art that had gone wrong. Um, my friend Nick Parker played the trumpet and did all the music for us and he'd only been learned, learned to play the trumpet for the last six weeks. But what happened was this experiment started to again break down some of the, the barriers of what we consider normal. Um, that's, that's what I like to do with all of my, my bits of work is to see what's normal and see what happens if we do the opposite of normal. See what happens if we pull it, pull it the seams of best practice. And this became a magical afternoon. Um, people described it as uh, just an afternoon of being imperfectly human together. The usual like status difference that you have of people on the stage and people in the audience was totally broken down. In fact, people in the audience probably felt as nervous as people on the stage. And ever since then, I've been interested in the potent power of inexpertise, the potent power of not knowing. Uh, Malcolm Gladwell famously writes about those 10,000 hours you need to be you need to practice something to become a master. Well, I'm sort of interested in the 70 hours it takes to become an inexpert, where you, you know just enough to do something, but you, you, don't know the, um, you don't know the right way of doing it. I think it was Shunru Suzuki, the Zen master, said, in the mind of a beginner, there are infinite possibilities. In the mind of the expert, there are few. So again, this, this intervention, this piece of work, this experiment started to reveal some of that. Um, and one more that I thought I'd share. I'm going to skip the next one because I think we should do stuff. I'm talking too much. Um, this is a project that's taken over my life for the last two and a half years. It came from thinking, what would happen if I did the opposite of a podcast? Everyone seems to be distracted by digital distractions nowadays. In fact, there's this whole thing called the attention extraction economy, which is people buying for our attention. So I thought, what would happen if I did the opposite of the podcast? So I came up with the idea of doing the world's first silent podcast featuring special guests. Um, and there's 100 episodes in it. Episode 98 went out today, so I'm almost at the end. And every episode involves me sitting in silence with a special guest for two minutes. Hence where that experiment at the start came. And it's been a, a magical adventure. I've travelled to places I've never been before. I've met people I've never met before. I've met some of my heroes, like uh, the artist David Shrigley, uh, comedian Vic Reeves. Tomorrow, I'm going to record the final episode with a, like, a world famous renowned hero of mine. I can't say who he is yet, just in case it goes wrong tomorrow. Um, and again, what's happened with this, this project is just by thinking like, what's the opposite of normal? Let's have it as an experiment. Let's try it. I don't know what's gonna happen. It's been profound. And people around the world download this. People use it as a source of escape. It's broken me out of my echo chamber of people that are like me. I've started meeting many people that aren't like me. And again, because it's empty, because it's silent, people can project into it whatever they need at the moment. People write to me and say, this is about peace and harmony, or this is about anxiety, or this is about mental health. Um, one person wrote and said, this is about single motherhood, isn't it? Because of one episode that had a little baby in it. And my answer to all of those people is, yeah, yeah. Well, they're all right, because um, we don't have a structure. It can be whatever you want it to be. Here's a short extract of me with Vic Reeves, the comedian. There you go. You can hear what the podcast is like. And, and then I've just started to try and spread these out around the world. In February this year, I did a thing called What the February on Instagram, which I thought, well, what would happen if I started to encourage other people to just do these wanton experiments in not knowing? And for the month of February, I set a different challenge every day. Um, and people would share it on Instagram. There was almost a million impressions and uh, 2,000 people taking part across five continents, which was bizarre. People doing stuff that they'd never done before in ways that I would never have imagined. And in fact, for what the February next year, um, I need to book the month out. Because again, 
It's something that, that took over my life. So reflecting on these, I just started to think, well, what is it about these projects? What are the, what's the uniting things around these projects that may be of interest to you? Um, because for me, it's the same process, be it doing these conceptual art projects. It's the same process that I think that I adopt or the same philosophies I adopt if I'm facilitating dialogue in a group or if I'm coaching someone or if I'm working on culture change. It's the same principles. And I think we can learn a lot from the art of not knowing in the arts in terms of how we go about human change. So I'd not thought about this before. So it's great to have the invitation. I thought, what are the typical things that happen when I come up with a project? And I'll share these and then we can have conversations and experiments around them. This is my Zoom poll, by the way, that I invented because I like flip charts. I don't particularly like slides. So my Zoom poll allows me to put things up on it as I go along. If you can't read them, don't worry, I'll send it all out afterwards. But these are, I think, the six things that inform the way that I work that may or may not be of interest, may, of interest to you. It may be total nonsense to you, in which case, apologies. Um, but the first one, it says on that, there you go, you can see it better now, quantum flirts. And this is about how I think ideas come about, for me at least, but also for many others I know and how I work with. And the idea of quantum flirting, I don't know if anyone's heard of it, um, comes from the, the author and um, quantum physicist Arnie Mindel, um, he's an American guy. And my understanding of what Arnie Mindel means by quantum flirting is this, it, it flips our perception of reality. So I'm sitting here in my, what I call my art bunker, and outside of the window, I've just noticed a magnolia tree. Now, my, the way that my brain has been conditioned, I can be thinking, right, I chose to notice that magnolia tree. At the corner of my eye, I chose to notice that magnolia tree. And that may well be true. But what Mindell says is a quantum flirt means that in that moment, I was simply open for the magnolia tree to call for my attention the other way around. I was, I was just simply open for that thing to call to me. And it's how I've started to think that inspiration works, is if we go looking for inspiration, it makes it a lot more difficult to find it. In the same way that if you're trying to go to sleep, the worst thing to do, and this is very topical because I assume no one's sleeping in this heat at the moment, the worst thing to do if you want to get to sleep is to try to go to sleep. The best thing to do is to do the opposite of that. But quantum flirting is just being open to inspiration presenting itself. And normally I will just be walking or running or something will happen or I'll be on a call or I'll just see a weird pattern or a weird shape and that will just set off a chain of thoughts. Um, I'll be out running and think, what was the opposite? What would the opposite be? The podcast. And that's how I think ideas work for me. It's why I hate art commissions when people say, can you do this? I can't do it because the joy of discovering it has gone. So I'm being told to do something. The second principle for me is I think that I always try to start before I'm ready. And this again, these are all practices of not knowing, I think. This is one of the things I love about social media. And there's a lot to, um, to not like about social media. If I come up with an idea, such as InExpert, I will then go on social media and say, right, InExpert, I'm doing this, this thing about uh, not knowing, it's gonna happen on this day, the venue to be confirmed and put it out there. Um, and it means that I can't really back out of it then. And it's that commitment, it's what in improvisation terms we'd say to, um, uh, to leap and then look. That means that whatever we do is, is open. Whatever we do is imbued with creativity. And if, we, if we're wanting to break into new ground and really explore our own creativity, my, my advice to anyone is to start before you're ready. If I'd sat and thought about any of the projects that I've done more than I did, I would never have done them. Or they would have been a bit crap because I would have overthought them. If we start before we're ready, we're really in that space of not knowing. The third one I thought of that's become really important to me is this idea of beautiful constraints. And beautiful constraints is a term I stole from Adam Morgan, who wrote a book called Beautiful Constraints. Um, I know Adam and I've told him I've read it, but I haven't, but I know what he's on about. Um, constraints are so important, I think, in, in creativity and also in the practice of not knowing. Um, and it says in brackets underneath this, constraints uh, towards the world of just enoughness, just enough constraint to provoke something without making it all certain. So for our little silent experiment at the start there, we had, we were in pairs, it was time for two minutes, 
and that was probably enough to make you not freak out too much, but to still leave it open to interpretation. And I think in all of my projects, all the stuff that I've really learned from, or the stuff that's been a real exploration of who I am and what I, what I do, has been um, where there's been a constraint. So the sound of silence, only 100 episodes. Every episode involves two minutes of silence recorded face to face with a guest. There are moments when I absolutely hate that constraint, when I've trudged all the way to Berlin to record two minutes of silence with someone who ironically wasn't there. Um, but can, the constraints are so important. Normally we think of a constraint as a problem, but a constraint can be liberating and comforting if we want to explore not knowing. And then in a previous life, it's not agile, but um, I'm not anti-planning. I was, I was trained in Lean Six Sigma. I spent many years in manufacturing. In fact, I'm a Lean Six Sigma green belt, which means if someone attacks me on the street, I can put them in a Kanban and they'll run off. But I'm not demonizing planning, but also being open to emergence, open to being able to dance with things as they are, is another key practice for me in this, uh, this idea of being artful with not knowing. And in all of my projects, they will kick off with a rough idea. I will commit to them before I know what's going to happen. There will be some constraints to sort of guide them. And then my role as, I don't know what I am, a curator, project leader, who knows, is to nurture and nudge. As the unexpected happens, to nudge and course correct. And quite often, stuff will happen that I didn't plan that was even better than what I could have thought of. So it's just this sort of nurturing, and nudging role if we want to work in this rather emergent way. And that leads to this next one, which I'm sure you would be familiar with. I'm going to run out of space in my Zoom poll, so I'll just hold them up in a minute. That's bad planning for you. Um, this is a phrase that I learned from a filmmaker, and it says, if you can't fix it, feature it. And he was telling me about on low budget, really constrained indie films, stuff would go wrong all of the time that they couldn't fix. Actors wouldn't be able to show up. Props would go wrong. Buildings would fall down. Um, and their mantra was, if you can't fix it, then feature it. And again, because we can't plan for it every virtuality, what I try to do, and this is again another brilliant practice of improvisation, which I know some of you are keen on, is to work with what is. The Buddhists, the Zen Buddhists say the obstacle becomes the path. And I try to take that really seriously. And a brilliant example of that um, that's just came to mind was with the Sound of Silence podcast. I recorded an episode with a lady called uh, Andrea, who is a curator of a big museum in London. We recorded the episode in London. She got on the train, went back up to Nottingham, and I realised I hadn't taken her photo. And one of the constraints of the podcast is everyone has to have a face-to-face -face photo holding the same logo. And I thought, oh god, no, I can't use the I can't use the episode. She said she'd print it out and hold it, and I thought, no, no, I'd know, and that would ruin the entire project for me. That's how obsessive I am with all of this. So she said, why don't you come up to Nottingham, visit the museum she works in, which is the Museum of Justice. Um, we take the photo there. And this mindset sort of kicked in a bit. And I thought, well, actually, no, why don't we re-record the episode there? Um, and I looked up the museum and they have some underground medieval ancient prison cells. that are totally dark. It's where prisoners were put um, in isolation. And I thought that would be a wonderful place to record silence. So we went up there. We went into these rooms. It was horrible, horrible, oppressive. Like it's the most silence that I've found in the world through this project. But whilst I was sitting in there recording the silence, right in the distance, I heard footsteps. And those footsteps reminded me of hearing the former hostage, Terry Waite, which some of you may know, some of you may not know. A guy that was held in solitary confinement in the late 80s, I think, for five years. Um, well known uh, humanitarian. And I remember the story of him talking about footsteps in the distance. And in that moment, I thought, oh, it'd be brilliant to have Terry Waite on my podcast. Um, so on the train on the way home, I emailed Terry Waite's agent, and Terry Waite was on it and was one of my amazing guests on the podcast. But none of that would have happened if I had remembered to take Andrea's photo. So that chain of events that led to that and Terry and I now doing work together on an inquiry into silence, none of that would have happened if I'd forgotten to take Andrea's photo. And for me, it's an example of if you can't fix it, feature it. Work with, work with what is. And two more of these. And I'll hold up the last one. And then, then we'll just have a chat about them and experiment with them. Hopefully some of it's of interest. Um, I don't know what this one means, but I like the way I wrote it down. Um, it makes my brain hurt when I say it, but I try to end with a beginning in mind. And I can't explain what I mean by that. Other than... I think it's very important to end well. 
for any project to end well. Everything is impermanent. Nothing can go on indefinitely, at least at the level of our human lives, um, or maybe human existence. So I always want to design and be overt and think about the end up front. Hence with the Sound of Silence podcast. After two episodes, I said, this is only gonna have a hundred episodes because that's made every episode more meaningful, particularly as I've recorded the last few episodes. It's like, my, that's t tomorrow it will be over. Like three years of work will be over then. With an expert, I said, this will never happen again. It can never happen again because I'll know what I'm doing next time. Um, with, I've just launched a, a gallery called the Spongelheim Gallery that has constraints and an endpoint built into it even before it's launched. And there's something about that there's something existential about building an endpoint into a project of finishing at its peak. I've had some brilliant people come back on Sound of Silence. Um, I had a hip hop producer email me today and say, I've got all these hip hop artists that want to be on it. And I had to say to him, oh, no, I'm sorry, but it's over. Um, so there is pain that comes with it. But then with impermanence, there is always pain and loss. So I always try to build in an endpoint up front to end well. And then the last one, it just says, Everything is towards not knowing. Um, I'm interested in, I'm less interested in answers and more interested in questions. Um, I don't particularly have any objectives for any of these projects other than it's an inquiry into something. And what I'm interested in is the question behind the question. Um, I have no tangible takeaways planned for you for these two hours, but hopefully you, you will leave with different questions to what you came in with. Because the thing with questions and deeper questions is we're more likely to act on them. There's something about our insatiable human curiosity and our, our desire to um, avoid not knowing that means we'll seek things out. In the dialogue work that I did, I, I flew around the world facilitating dialogue on difference and gender with a Zen monk. Um, and this was in a corporate environment. People used to leave with no tangible takeaways or actions or measures, which was really disturbing for them up front. But they left as activists, they left with a passion, they left with an anger, they left with a hope, and they left with a load of questions, which meant that they actually went out to the world and did something with them. So all of this work is, uh, again, there's nothing wrong with knowing, there's nothing wrong with tangible takeaways, there's nothing wrong with um, measures and KPIs. But I'm curious about what they inhibit. Where do they inhibit the wonder and the magic that lies, that lies behind it all? So I'm going to pause there. I, mean, I it was a bit of a download of what I'm interested in, what I think lies behind the art of not knowing. Um, so what I thought we'd do, Pierre, is if we can go into groups of maybe three. Okay. Let's, let's try three. And my question simply is this, is what, what strikes you as interesting? What resonates? What doesn't resonate? What irritates? What activates? What stimulates? I can't think of any other words that end in eight. Well, I can, but they're rude. Um, just what has struck you of being of interest of what we've said? And then we'll come back and then we'll explore some of those things further, maybe with some experiments. Okay, so again, what's the question? What, what has intrigued, yeah, what, oh, let me think. What has struck you about what I've been saying over the last 15 minutes? What interests you? That'd be pretty much it. Okay. And let's just do let's just do five minutes. So just throw some stuff in. Oh, let's no, let's do seven minutes. Seven minutes, fine. Seven minutes. And just what struck you? It doesn't have to be stuff you like. It's just what struck you in what I've said. What what has it churned up for you? What are you interested in? And then we'll come back and we'll hear that, and then we'll work out where we go next. Excellent. You create my, you create my agenda for me. On three, one two, three. What might be a leaping off point for us to chat about or experiment with? Let's hear from a few people and build out. I mean, I'm interested in having this as a co-inquiry. And what I mean by that is maybe we've got shit. I'm assuming you're interested in this because you showed up. Um, what's bubbled up here? So we're exploring not knowing in the way of not knowing, um, rather than me come in and say, here's a load of stuff that I'm going to make you get because I don't know any of that. So what type of things did you talk about? What came up for you? Yeah, the end. Uh, the end of uh, uh, of our uh, meeting. Um, I came with this idea. That it's the the pleasure people have 
uh, to uh, going in that uh, creative space, in that not knowing space and discovering what's emerged. That's, uh, there's a, a real pleasure. Yeah. That is yeah. fine there. Yeah. Uh, uh, I, I, I just watched the, the, the picture that you give with uh, uh, people wearing their portrait, the smile that they have. Eh? Yeah. And the, the number of people that wanted to blog with you in silence, it's amazing yeah. because I think there is a real pleasure going in that space yeah. and explore that space of creativity. It, I think it's a very important motivation. Yeah, that's lovely, Donald. It made me, yeah, it made me respond here, made me shiver in my shoulders. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And there's, um, uh, Fatima Zara, you may want to chip in. I was in a conversation with, with her a minute ago. Um, we were talking about how, I mean, these, these are conceptual art projects I've shared with you, but I'm really interested in liberating art as being, that uh, art as activism, be that in a workplace, be that in society, be that, be that wherever. Um, but one of the most important things, I think, is that whoever is curating that or whoever's the artist behind that, is also practicing it. So we were talking, Fatima Zara and I were talking about coaching. Um, and I do, oh, towards not knowing just fell off. Um, I do one-to-one -one coaching with people in the, in the same way where we may be exploring what is the opposite of their norms? What is the opposite of their go-to? But not hypothetically, I'll create live experiences with people. But that only works and that only becomes pleasurable because I also don't know what I'm doing. I, I will never do the same intervention twice. Um, I'm a massive introvert. So to sit in silence with strangers is painful for me. But there's something around that we're in this together. That's what creates the pleasure. That's what made the inexpert experiment such a magnificently human thing. Because as a coach or as a leader or as anyone, you can only take people where you're prepared to go yourself. Um, and I get really, again, it's another of my bugbears with the world of Ted. And by Ted, I mean any of those stand up, here's the answer type things. Here's your quick life hack thing. Is I suspect a lot of the time the people aren't practicing what they preach. Um, and I think that, that just feels so important that if we're going to lead people into a space of not knowing and creativity, we're not leading them, we're on an adventure together there. So that, yeah, that's what it sparked in my mind, Donald. What else did you talk about? What else has interested you? Oh, and we'll do an experiment. I'm going to call it the Donald experiment. You've just given me an idea, Donald. Um, but we'll do that soon, if I remember. Yeah, for that, Frederick, I saw a hand go up in the corner of my eye. Yeah. yeah. Um, with um, Silke and Ellie, we, um, we spoke about uh, the, the massively creative and generative power of the opposite of, because in a, in a lot of things, there are pre-agreed spectrum like cold and hot and far and close yeah. but your your question of the opposite of ted each of us were seeing very different things yeah and so by describing the opposite it was allowing us to um describe in a in a very um vulnerable and uh, and at the same time very safe way what we understood ted to be yeah, yeah. And, um, and it was massively generative as in for a team that may be plagued with groupthink or anything like that, show something and say, what could you, we do uh, that is the opposite of this? Yeah. Give license to everyone. Yeah, yeah, brilliant. Because no, that's exactly right. Um, op the idea of opposite as we think of it as humans isn't real, is it? It's just... It's not. I, I don't think it's the laws of the universe. It's a, it's laws of language. I think possibly. I don't. I don't know enough about it whether that's true or not. But the act of exploring, and it may not be the opposite. It's exploring what is not this, brings out so much stuff. I, I trained for years in Gestalt psychology, which um, a guy called Fritz Pearls and his wife Laura Pearls come up with. I always credit Laura. She never gets any credit. It's always down to Fritz. But they both co-created it. In fact, Laura made it much more human than, than Fritz did. Um, and one of the principles of uh, Gestalt psychology 
is called the paradoxical theory of change. Um, which is, it's confusing because it's paradoxical, but my understanding of it is that we get more change by becoming more aware of what we already are, rather than striving to be something we're not. So just by deepening our awareness of who we already are, we actually shift more than trying to be something we're not. And Pearls used to say, and again, I'm not anti-goal setting, um, but Pearls used to say, those that live their lives totally focus, focused on the future never catch up with the reality they anticipate. So a lot of the experiments that, that, would, that I would do as someone interested in Gestalt is, say if someone tells me they can't draw, I will get them to do the work, a really bad drawing. I just do, do prove it, do a really bad drawing. And in fact, I released a book two years ago called 100 Crap Faces. And the challenge in that, it was a book for people that don't think they can draw. There's 110 pages in that book, and they're blank, so you don't even need to buy the book to do it. Um, and the challenge is, by the end of the book, can you draw 100 really bad portraits of people? And at the bottom of each page, it just says crap, not crap. And at the end of each page, you judge it. And what happened, no one has been able to complete the challenge. Because after about three or four, you accidentally do a good one. And then you accidentally do another good one. Or someone else says, no, I like that one. Um, so with like, with like someone, I remember I coached someone once that was moving through life at such a pace. And so the only bit of work I did with her was in the corporate head office. They had like this big, long coffee thing, like a big, long street in the middle of the head office. I gave her the challenge of could she walk from one end of this street to the other, this is in, inside the building, but could she make it last two hours? And it, it was the most challenging thing she ever did. Um, but again, it's what happens if we start to explore, not necessarily just the opposite, what is, what is not quick? What is, what, what's, yeah, what's, what lies in the counterintuitive? Um, so yeah, I think it's a, it's a wonderful thing to do. And I, I try and do it with myself all, all the time. What, what else did you, you come up with? So there's a few experiments and thinking we can do here to play with some of this stuff. What else is of interest here? It just come, came to my mind that the opposite, uh, if we use the opposite as action, not as a word, as uh, Frederick was saying, it's called uh, hot, uh, rainy, sunny. So if you use the opposite as action, so what I'm doing right now, what the opposite. So uh, to attend the meeting, to leave the meeting uh, halfway, uh, running instead of uh, walking, like you just uh, were experimenting with, uh, with the girl. Go uh, walk this uh, 100 meter in two hours. So uh, maybe starting with the action, can come up with different uh, uncertain things. Yeah, yeah, that, that's that's brilliant. Because um, there's another important thing that you raise there. Is it uh, Eli? E -E Eli? Eli. Eli. Yeah. Um, is this whole principle, and it's another improvisation principle of aiming to fail happy. Because if we're going to do this stuff, we don't know what's going to happen. Or the bigger thing, the whole idea of rapid prototyping, being to do an experiment to, to fail cheap, fast and happy. Um, because normally I cross the road really carefully. It probably wouldn't be a fail happy experiment if I decided to do the opposite, which will experiment for that. But it's finding out this world of just enoughness. What is just enough safety for us and security? Psychological and social safety that we can experiment with it. Because a lot of these experiments um, are around fundamental shifts in power dynamics and relational dynamics as human beings. And I teach on the masters, uh, well, I used to teach on the masters in organizational change at Ashridge, which no longer exists. And one of the fundamental things at the heart of all change, be it coaching, be it leadership, be it whatever you do, is that human beings are engaged in this process of civilizing the entire time. In this process of civilizing, we agree norms, we agree values, we agree power structures and power differentials, whether we know it or not, we, we agree those things all the time. Um, we agree in, out, in and out groups. And if we're interested in social change or cultural change or individual change, we have to start to unravel some of those things. And it's really difficult to unravel unhelpful power dynamics if you don't know what they are and power dynamics can be equally helpful. It's really difficult to challenge norms if you don't know what they are. And I spent 20 years in, the, in a big corporate organization. 
Um, and whilst I was reasonably good at doing culture change work in there, I was completely blind to what was going on because I was part of it. And so this is another thing that I'm really interested in is the power of the outsider. There's nothing wrong with expertise. I wouldn't want an inexpert surgeon to be working on me or, a, or an outsider airline pilot to be flying me necessarily. But on other stuff like that, the outsider just brings this brilliant naivety, I think, where they can, it's, it's the whole legend of the child, isn't it? The child saying, why is that? Why is that? Why would you do that? Um, and then we can name some of those things that, you, that you, you're talking about there. We can challenge some of these power dynamics. But this is where I think that these artful ways of intervening, these artful interventions um, get suppressed because they are a threat to power. Um, you only need to look at uh, any sort of revolution and the people that are the most threatening that are locked up are the artists, the poets, the orators, the playwrights, because they move in weird and mysterious ways and we don't know what's going to happen. Um, and at a really subtle level, I think that, ha that happens in, in society um, where we create the one right way of doing it. And I, 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 I love all the people in the world of Agile and I see it in Agile where we create these really rigid, this is the way it's done. Um, and fair enough, it may be the most efficient way to do it. I don't know anything about Agile. But I'm also interested in, okay, but it doesn't have to be. That's a social construction. What if we toyed with the opposite? Uh, what if we didn't make it wrong, but experimented? That was a bit of a rant, but thank you. Any, anything else that struck you of interest? Anything else that's bubbling up? Anything that does or doesn't make sense? And um, I think we'll do some experiments in a minute. There's a few that I've come up with. I would have... I would have a question to you, and it would be, how would you implement this structure, this uh, state of being and acting in this agile and creative way in the world situation, which is really chaotic? Yeah, wow. Um, if I knew the answer, I'd probably be on a different Zoom call. Um, Actually, no, I wouldn't. I'd still be here because it'd be too much pressure. So we were saying, how how could this be used to shift things in the world? Um, shift I, or just be in peace with and yeah. be empowered with the proposition? But my immediate and totally honest answer is I don't know. I have absolutely no idea. Um, other than the idea of an intervention causing a massive global shift is probably a bit of an illusion in the same way as it is in organizations, where we have these like, utopian solutions or silver bullets that are gonna change everything. Uh, change happens at that local level. So if I think of that What the February experiment, in all my years of consulting on culture change in organizations, I think that thing that I did on Instagram that people around the world were doing was probably the most effective bit of culture change work I've ever done. I didn't intend it to be, because people experimented at a local level and the local people they were interacting with were influenced by those experiments. I remember when, when um, I, I used to do a lot of work in factories, hence my Lean Six Sigma background. And for years, um, the factories that I were in were trying to imitate Toyota to implement the Toyota production system. Um, and it would, ne would never work. You'd get Lean Six Sigma consultants would come in and there'd be this whole company wide thing. Um, it was all about rhetoric. It was all about, here's what you need to do. Um, but I started working with a guy that was from Toyota and he said, the reason Toyota factories are open to anyone is because no one, no one can see what actually makes a difference. What makes a difference is totally invisible. It's in the fabric of the norms and the way in which we work. I don't know if Toyota's still like this. This was in, in the uh, late nineties. Um, so the piece of work that I did on implementing this was totally different. We just started on one production line um, with, one team of three shifts of operators. And it started in conversation and it started in experiments. Um, it started in legitimizing them to be able to list every reason why nothing would ever change around here and for the managers to not rescue them or to explain it. It just involved us taking months and months of starting to facilitate just even the managers and the, um, the operators being able to talk with each other. But the, the really important thing about that is it was all really visible. We held workshops on the line rather than in the meeting room. We did these experiments where people would start taping out the floor and setting standard work. It was all visible. 
and what was brilliant is all of the other production lines would be pointing and laughing and saying, look at those idiots over there. Look, yeah, what's going on? But then they'd become really curious and they'd wander over. And they go, what's all this? Uh, I'm using operator language, so it's, apologies for the swearing. What's all this bullshit? And then the operators, the really tough operators, would be saying, well, yeah, it is a bit bullshit, but it's, it's actually helping us in a way. And then, I mean, it's what we use the word viral change, but this is genuinely viral social change. And then it would start to spread. And then the, the really cynical operators and other lines was starting to say, well, why aren't we getting any of that? Come on, we want that event. It's not fair. And so we'd move to them. And then gradually it took to basically do the culture change work on this one production floor that had, I think it had seven lines on it. it. Took a year and a half. And that's, that's the one production floor. But I think the, the point I wanted to make there is change happens at the local level. It happens through experimentation. It happens through managers and leaders and those in positions of uh, influence practicing what they preach and we had a we had an intention i think there's an in, a difference between an intention and an objective our intention was to stimulate change that would help the factory um we had no objective other than that and it meant that we had brilliant moments of the operators breaking the rules um the operators breaking the rules in order to make their line more efficient I remember one guy broke some procurement rules by going out and buying a piece of kit that he thought would really help. It broke no safety rules, it broke no quality rules, but it highlighted an antiquated procurement rule. Um, and the factory managers wanted to sack this operator, but we said, hold on a minute, he's just highlighted how rubbish your processes are. So all of those things, none of those things would have happened if we did it the way that I used to do it, which was, let's have a grand plan, let's roll it out and scale it up at pace around. So that would be where my hope would be how this happens in society. Um, but the power dynamics and power differentials we're up against are absolutely huge. Um, so I, I, I think I probably asked more questions than answers, but I think it has to happen at a local level. Um, and it has to happen live and in the moment. You know, I always say to people, there isn't a moment other than now. Um, and you only have any sort of agency over yourself. So it's down to you to experiment. The, the thing about creativity, I think, is all of these things, people will only make a stand for something that's important to them. I've started using the language of activism rather than change agents uh, because we, we're creating activists here. And a lot of organisations don't like that language because activism, people think, oh, right, that's dangerous, that's revolutionary, that's, that's all of that. But it is. If we're genuinely wanting that, people... I will only make a stand for stuff that's important to me. If I see inequality, I will make a stand for it. And I can't not. Um, if it's something I don't really care about, I won't make a stand for it. So I think, how do we create local activism? How do we use art as activism? Start locally, experiment, and have some buddies because this can get lonely really quickly. That's my riff on that one. Anything else? I thought, thought of an experiment, but I mean, this is, hopefully this is of interest to you. Um, it's, it's lovely to chat with you. Anything else that's coming up for you that you'd like to explore? Wolfgang, I know you. I'm sure you have a, a point. Um, yeah, well, uh, I think the, um, this openness uh, towards, you know, where we're going, I, I love it. It's, it's brilliant. I think it's very much um, what, uh, uh, what we're also um, practicing in the, in the, in the agile uh, world. Um, where the difference is a little bit is around the, the um, how should I say, what is the intended outcome, right? So yeah. without having at least a sense of the place to be, not even a direction, right? But a place where, where I want to be a vision, any road might lead someplace, right? And in some cases, that's awesome to drive creativity, to give us opportunity, give us space to explore, um, you know, have what in, in my uh, previous uh, 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 life we once called knowledge accidents, right, yeah. um, to happen. So all that's just great. But at the same time, um, I, I might not actually get to the intended outcome um, yeah. if, if I don't at least have some sort of um, at least understanding and clarifying before what I want to get to 
right? And again, be very clear, this is not about the how I get there or on which way I get there, right? It's, yeah. it's more the general sense of a direction. Yeah, I think that, that's so important what you've said there, Wolfgang, because it's not, it's not an either or. It's, right. Uh, right. It's, it's this point, it's on, on here somewhere, is what is, the, what is the world of just enoughness? What is just enough structure for this thing? If I'm wanting to evacuate people from a, from a building, it's, I don't want to leave it that open to, and encourage innovation necessarily, although that might save people, I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, what I'm fascinated by is the obsession with planning and structuring up front that actually just inhibits anything actually happening. And this window of just enoughness, um, Barry Mason, the academic, wrote about this. He called it the window of safe uncertainty. I wrote, I wrote something about it years ago. Um, that window of safe uncertainty where there is just enough structure and just enough control to mitigate the biggest of risk, but leaving everything up, else up for grabs. And that's different for every situation in every moment. Um, and this is one of the things when I, when I teach on the master's programs, I'm inevitably met with polar opposites. People thinking, yeah, you rip up everything. Yay, it's a free for all, it's anarchy. And they say, well, we can't possibly change anything. And I'm not saying either of those are the way, or they're both true. Mm -hmm. But I think that's the thing is what is, the thing that I'm really interested in, in any piece of work, I mean, for projects like the podcast, it's just me. It doesn't, if it all goes wrong and I lose all loads of money, it doesn't matter, it's only me that suffers. But in organisations, if I'm working on culture change, those initial conversations around the just enough structure, the just right amount, are so vital, aren't they? It's um, because there's lots of traps. Quite often, organisations will want to plan emergence and just think well, that's crazy, or will want to measure something that's novel. And it's like, how can you how can you decide how to measure it if you don't know what it is? But then other things will be really helpful. So yeah. I, I, if you keep saying that, it will make me a happy man, Wolfgang, because it isn't either or. It's for this particular situation. Where does structure enable? Where does structure constrain? I always get that. I always get that question from uh, graduates. I do. I used to do a lot of work on teaching innovation and creativity to graduates, and they'd all be working in groups on these projects, and then I'd wander around, and they'd say to me, "Am I doing this right?" All the time, and my response to them was always, "Is it helping?" And if they said yes, I'd say carry on. If they say no, I'd say do something different. Right. Um, I think that's it. Yeah. Very good. Very yeah. Helpful. Anything else? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, just one. There was one thought um, that we also discussed in our group of three um, that there's a kind of value in sort of exploring the problem first and not sort of jumping to yeah. some sort of solution which yeah. i mean i see myself very often jump to some solution but i also see other people uh, or teams specifically um, really like to avoid this kind of oh we have an issue we have a problem this is, feels strange this feels not good yeah. they rush towards something yeah could be a solution or maybe there are better ones yeah yeah lovely and again, there isn't a one size fits all answer for that, is there? Sometimes the first thing you come up with might be brilliant, sometimes it might not be. Um, but I, I always think for myself as well is, I assume that I'm gonna to gravitate towards the familiar and the comfortable in everything I do. I just assume that that's gonna be what I do, even though I do weird and wonderful work. Um, and is it, it's a really important thing, is it Dürte? Is that how you pronounce it? Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. Good. Well, it's cl close enough. Yeah. yeah. Um, really important thing around play in this as well, isn't there? Um, that it seems somehow, at least in the UK, um, that we separated play and work at some point. Um, and it's like if something's important, it can't be playful. It has to be serious. It's a bit like the assumption I was talking about at the start that silence must be very zen and sombre. It doesn't have to be. Um, but you can, if you're playful with important stuff, you can do some amazing things. And where do you have this space to play? Um, this space to play and fail happy. I started a thing, I think it was seven years ago now, called The Lab. Um, 
I don't know many of the Agile community have been to. And the lab was simply a place to be playful with not knowing, for facilitators, for coaches, for all sorts of people to come and try stuff out that they've never done before, just to see what happened. Um, but the most important thing was that it was a shared space of not knowing. Everyone was in it together and you could play. And that had that net effect of people thinking, right, I've got this piece of work coming up. This is what I was going to do, but I'm going to experiment with something different. And through play, they'd come up with something wonderful. The worst that's going to happen, it's, it's going to confirm that your initial idea was the best one, in which case, brilliant. There's not really anything to lose there, is there? Um, but play's not immeasurable. Um, play, I don't know. There's a lo whole load of assumptions around adults and play, isn't there? Yeah, I know. I'm, I'm playing improv theatre as well, so I really like this yeah. playful approach. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it, again, being playful, there's something around it that um, I, mean, the, I, I like the, the, the two things of being playful with not knowing. You, and you'll know anyone that's done improvisation. It deepens relationships in ways that you can't explain because you're being bold and vulnerable simultaneously at the same time. And there's people that I wrote my dissertation on spontaneity years ago. And my research was performing improv in London, um, which is wonderful and terrifying at the same time. But there are people that I'd be on stage with for three minutes and they feel like lifelong friends. And it's like, how can that happen? But there was something around that boldness and vulnerability live and in the moment that was, um, that was wonderful. So, yeah, place, place spaces um, feel really important as well. And if you think about how children play, if I think about how I used to play, that was interesting, I said used to. Um, I never used to go to my friend's house and say, right, we're coming out now, we're going to have an hour, this is the game we're going to play, this is how we're going to know um, whether it's any good or not. I mean, even like structured games like football, we just go and, go and play football. Um, but again, this is not demonising structure and plans. It's like, wh where is this helpful or not? Absolutely helpful. And this is helpful in, in the, so you asked a question before is, you don't know the link with what you're doing with the Agile world. So here, our Agile world here is a little bit different than the average Agile world. It's here, Agile is just uh, the notion of new work, of new normal, yeah. of experimenting ideas. Yeah. <clears throat> and not about the methodology purely. But, and why was it? the reasons why I thought about you to come here was this creative part, this, this mindset. Because if you understand, in Agile is not a methodology, but you have patterns, you have trends, let's say trends. Yeah. And when you, and you, if you're on a new normal in the post COVID, and, and we have to start everything again, we, we, don't have the, we don't have templates, you don't have processes, is the unknown unknown, is we don't know. Yeah. And the only way to get out is starting moving. And starting moving starts with having a couple of options, being creative. Yeah. And, and, yeah. and this is here, you, you, where we say, unleash the creativity part, which is a huge part of what we call agile. Is that I say, say, we need this refreshment because even we are all in our tunnels, right, the whole day. And sometimes you have to open our chakras. Yeah. Oh, yes, there are different options, and that's cool. And maybe it's crazy, but crazy good, you know? Yeah. And, yeah. and, and it's absolutely necessary. Yeah. And I will ask here Frederick, which is also head of cultural change. Which one? Me or Fred Madrigal? Uh, Frederick. Frederick from Kuala Lumpur, which is a French uh, American. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, actually, I had a. I was very interested in the exchange you had with Wolfgang because um, having started in consulting, obviously, I was told I, I I knew the answers. You know, that's called best practices when we've never seen any other practices. Um, but I was feeling that it is good in a way to have a sense of of. Um, of what the answer can be, but at the same time, I'm very interested in seeing if at the same time with your, what's the opposite of, we can have a part of the team go with some constraints and have a team 
freeing themselves from the constraints to see what is. And in particular in innovation, I remember being at a, at a conference about who got innovation and then hearing big companies saying, oh yeah, we need to innovate simply. And then here is the 5G and the IOTs and so on. Where in Africa, they, they use completely different, very basic things. And so I'm really interested in seeing how would you merge or how would you let um, these two um, ambivalent realities um, coexist? And how yeah. would you follow a little bit what Wolfgang is saying so that we're, we're not completely wasteful and we're a little bit reliable in a way, but on the other hand, we also let this creative thing that could be just even better. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. I have the same boring start point for all of these questions. It's like, I, I don't know. Um, <laughs> because I don't, I don't think there is, well, there wouldn't be one way of doing it, but what I'd be interested in doing is how do you, how do, how do we start a movement? Yeah, if, how, how do you start a movement? You need activists of different levels. You need some that are bringing structure, some that are bringing meaning, some that are, rate, are, are rating, some that are building skills, but then you also need the subversives. You need the, the, the gorilla, the experimenters. Um, so how can you do all of that? But the, the, the thing where my thoughts first went is before you even get to that point, at least as an external consultant now, there's so many things, there's so many traps in the way to make sure you never even get to start something like that. So, so I think there's a number of different streams. When, when I worked in manufacturing, they, they used to have these huge change plans, like these Gantt charts that went on for miles. They'd have all these different things about designer experiments and manufacturing. And then there'd be one line at the bottom that said people, and in brackets it would say Steve. So that's the assumption that I think we're up against there is that the people are separate and different to the organization. Whereas I say, no, the people are the organizing. The, you can, the, the organization doesn't exist in the way that we imagine it does. But then it's like, how do you actually, I, I love the idea that you said there, of how could you have these different streams of activists creating a movement? Plus you've got business as usual as well, because you don't want to destroy all of that. Um, but the traditions of culture change and a lot of what's written about it um, sort of get in the way of that. I, I think procurement processes inhibit a lot of it. I, that's why I refuse to do RFPs or pitches because they're only going to go with something that they like. And I sort of want them to not like it a bit. Um, I, want it, I want it to provoke something and be different. But there's, um, there's some, I'll see if I can dig out a blog that I wrote on it. There's some brilliant work by a guy called Paul Vatslavik. He wrote a book that's called, I'll try and, I'll send a list out of all of these things that I mentioned, because I never know what I'm going to mention up front. Um, he wrote a book called Change, Problem Formation and Resolution. It's, it's a dense book. I don't recommend you read it. It's, I, I still have the mental scars from trying to read it. Um, but the essence of it is brilliant. He says that um, most effort, it's a, it's a therapeutic, it's a therapy book. You can apply it to culture change as well. And he says most efforts to change result in stuckness, in patterns of stuckness. And he says there's four patterns of stuckness that typically happen even with the most well-meaning therapist stroke organization. And the first is the try harder pattern, to try harder from the same mindset that created it. And this, I come across this so often. I remember working with a big uh, blue chip organization that was interested in empowerment. Empowerment being a horrible word. It sounds like it's, it sounds like some tower to me. Um, I think what they meant was uh, the dispersal of power and giving a voice to those that don't have a voice. So I assume they meant. Um, they then explained what they've been doing. And they said, well, what we did is we got a, a group of talent together that worked with the board and HR to come up with a model of empowerment that we've then rolled out, that, that cascaded for people to follow. And I just said, well, isn't that the opposite of what you, you want? <laughs> isn't that, that's what you're trying to get rid of, isn't it? That elite group creating that. And just in that, just in that blind, I don't mean ignorance in a stupid way, I just mean it in the way that I'm ignorant to my own patterns. Um, they just went, oh my God, yeah, that's, that's completely true. So there's that try harder pattern is the typical thing. And that's where I love what you're saying there is having a number of different approaches simultaneously to see what happens is wonderful. The second pattern he talks about is oversimplification, where we just say, okay, well, we are going to change that bit over there and that will change everything. Oversimplification, oversimplification is like these company-wide messages that we assume that everyone is gonna make the same meaning of it. 
Yeah, and again, th there's nothing wrong with them, but let's not assume that everyone's taking the same from it. And those patterns of oversimplification cause more stuckness. The third one I mentioned earlier is the utopian solutions, the silver bullets, like you must get this all the time. We're going to bring in agile. That will solve everything. We're going to bring in a new leader. We're going to, we've read this book and we're going to do that. We're going to have this consultant. And I think the only reason we're addicted to these utopian solutions is because when they inevitably don't work, we can blame the utopian solution. Go, oh, no, that consultant was rubbish. Let's get another one who's got the silver bullet. Um, and then the final one that he talks about is paradox, is we create paradoxes. We create this stuck culture because we're giving out two conflicting messages. And in my world, it's always um, innovate, but don't take any risks. I actually saw a CEO say that at his big town hall. He said, there's two things I want from everyone next year. This is a 100,000 people organization. So there's two things I want from you all next year. One is innovate, the other is don't screw up. Um, and of course, everyone, he sort of half meant it as a joke and a challenge, but everyone's going to come down on the side of not screwing up because not screwing up is what pays the wages and all of those things. So I'd be interested in a number of streams of work in that example you said that look to disrupt some of those stuck patterns, knowing that we're inevitably going to fall into them, but one of them may yield something. Um, there's a brilliant, my favourite book is called Orbiting the Giant Hairball. I don't know if you've read it, by Gordon McKenzie. <clears throat> so Gordon, again, I'll write all these down. Um, Gordon worked at Hallmark Cards. He's no longer with us, which is really sad because I wanted to meet him. Um, and it's a brilliant, it has no tangible takeaways in this book whatsoever. It's just stories of his crazy adventures, Hallmark Cards. Um, and he was saying that Hall, the, the hairball analogy says that in the 60s, Mr. Hallmark or Mr. Hall and Mr. Mark got together and said, let's, let's make some cards. Let's call it Hallmark. And he says that name of the company was the first hair in the hairball. Then they needed to register the company. Then they needed a policy. And then before you know it, a few years later, you got this massive entangled hairball. But one of the things Gordon set up within um, Hallmark was like this sort of free independent state. I can't remember what it was, but it was accountable to no one, gen genuinely and not accountable to anyone, even though it was in the payroll. So it sort of was. And they were free to do this type of experimenting in the opposite. Um, they were free to be invited to meetings with, to disrupt things that are going around the normal way. But the status quo tends to win out. So that's why my overall answer is I don't know. Yeah, I have no answers, only questions. But hopefully that inspires some experiments, Frederick. Yeah. Donald. Yeah. Um, to uh, try to start a movement, uh, sometimes I, uh, in, the, in that space of not knowing, I, I start with this uh, questions. Uh, what's not there that needs to be there? Yeah, nice. What's not there that needs to be there? Yeah. What, what tends to be the typical response you get to that? There is oh, not yeah. knowing, <laughs> so <Yes>. let's. <laughs> it's a kind of vector of looking to, to something. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we have to find out. A, yeah, well, yeah. I think those questions. It's a lovely question, and those questions up front. I mean, it's it's slightly different if you're internal or external, but I don't think it's yeah. different is yeah. if you can't have those types of questions right from the go, it's only going to get more yeah. difficult. Yeah. I didn't like a lot of what Peter Block wrote, but that's one of the things that I did like, is if you can't challenge and provoke and do all of that in that very first engagement, then, then you won't be able to do it later on. It's only going to get more and more difficult. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the same as a friend, because I'm dyslexic, I can never remember names, which is why I love Zoom, because it's all written down and I look really cool. I can remember all your names. But someone said to me, the best way to learn to remember names is to get them wrong quickly. Um, yeah. And I think it's a similar thing with this. If you can't challenge in that initial meeting or ask those awkward questions. I had it last year with a piece of work I did in Chicago um, for a consulting company. And the, it's the organization development department had brought me in and they knew the work that I did. But I was meeting with one of the senior partners. Um, and when I came in, I just immediately thought, oh, this guy is so arrogant. He, he came in, he went, 
right, yeah. So, so tell me how you're going to guarantee success here. You're going to wow these these intelligent people. We, we don't suffer fools gladly around here, so I need to know that you're going to deliver this. And in that moment, like being a, I've got such a please others be liked driver, so I'm constantly battling against this. I had two choices. I, I could either collude with him or I could challenge it and risk losing a massive piece of work. And I think age helps. I can get away with it more the older I've got. Um, I just said, well, I can't. I can't guarantee any of that. Um, I, w I wish I could. We can, this is where we need to work on this together. And it, it was an awkward sort of 10 minutes, but we came out the other side of it, like in a partnership. And he's a lovely man. And the masks went down. So those awkward questions right up front. One of my favorite questions when I, I get a massive long presentation around what needs to change around here, that I ask is, uh, what happened if you didn't do anything? And quite often people go, oh, oh, we didn't fall. <laughs> it's not a brilliant way of winning work, to be honest, because I talk myself out of a lot of work that way. But it's like, are you just doing this to feel that you need to do something? Ralph Stacey was a big influence on my work. I don't know if you've come across his writings on complexity. I think he either influenced or was friends with Dave Snowden. I can't remember. I say was, then maybe they still are. I don't want to create rumours. Um, but Stacey used to say most organisational traditions and structures are institutionalised defences against anxiety. Um, they are most um he said like most traditions most things that organizations do most habits are institutional defenses against anxiety to actually stop everything changing so it fills me with joy donald that someone like you is there up front asking these questions um not just because they're clever questions because we're genuinely interested i think that's one of the things when i first started coaching I'd be thinking, oh, God, I need to think of a clever question. What questions do I ask? And then gradually you realise, actually, no, you just ask the questions that you're genuinely interested in, however mm -hmm. stupid that they are. Yeah, wonderful. But coming with a question which is uh, uh, looking at a situation and, and bringing the opposite yeah. is very, very helpful. So like when you make a transformation, so which is part of my job, is you can't bring more structure in already overcrowded structure yeah you have yeah. to bring creativity yeah and if you work with creative people you have to bring structure yeah. you have always to have to understand the context and you come with the balance so it's completely what you're speaking about yeah. and i do it in a very weird manner because this is how i manage my projects yeah because yeah. when you start a project this is this is what i want to do and at least this is what i don't want to do yeah. So when you ask, okay, you want to be agile, and what is your agile? And then you ask the question, and what isn't your agile? Yeah. Then you have a more valid and honest scope. Yeah. Yeah, lovely. And I think this is the importance, Pierre, of um, knowing, the, knowing the dominant language, knowing the norms, knowing the way things go around here is so you can, you can go to that where it's helpful. Or the way that, I, that my last few years in a big company pretty much was, I don't know, giving the illusion. No, no illusion is too strong a word. That's what I hesitated. Of having plans, having the things that people liked, but then also being able to work the opposite as well. Being able to speak the language, but to also experiment at the same time. And that, that dance. Uh, um, I think if we can get in that space, um, stuff can happen. Yeah, and, and as a coach, you're using a lot of this. You see? I don't want to do this. Is it okay? Yeah, yeah. You heard the wall. Okay, uh, again, it's all right. I just show uh, this is the window. No, I want to force. Go. Oh, well, you yeah. cannot force is a, a movement assimilation. Yeah. But uh, then you have also make the the rupture disruption is also in the language. Yeah. And and drawing, and and this is very helpful. Yeah. So what you, what you uh, show us today, for me, makes a lot of sense. Yeah. I'm very, very thankful. Oh, good. Thank you. I'm having this conversation with my daughter at the moment, who's 13, um, and doesn't like school. As a creative dyslexic artist, she doesn't particularly like school. Um, and it's so tempting to say, oh, the British school system, at least the state. It's weird. We, it's, the, it's the public school system, but it's not. It's, it's confusing what we call it in the UK. It's just the traditional state system. But I'm trying to say to her, look, it's worth 
it's worth it because this is the language on which the world works. This is the way in which the world works. So don't totally reject it because even if you want to be some sort of creative activist rebel in the future, it's really helpful to know all this stuff. Um, and you can choose it. It's not totally evil. You can switch into that when you when it's helpful. Um, and that flexibility is so important. You learn a lot from the, from your kids. I learned a lot. I guess I've been educated on agile or whatever through my kids. Yeah. They they see uh, my big big victory is uh, the, my youngest daughter with five told me, "Oh, Dad, can you stop being so childish?" And in turn, I say, "Yeah." <laughs> nice. And, and and she she went at school. Um, she's great at school, but she was in a school in France, and then people ask it. Or what do you think about the school? The level is not good. They're learning not that much. Or the parents, right? You see, and and I'm I'm hardly honest, so very quite rude, very German with rudeness, right? And and they say my daughter is not here to learn. My my daughter is here to create a social network of friends. Yeah, she she yeah. learns with only one person, and that's me. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, lovely, lovely. But it is, so even though, let's say, uh, there is something, I guess, uh, some movie about a great dancer, about the different levels of intelligence. Right. And she, I was always bad at school, but I had my intellect, my brain was in my feet. Yeah. yeah. And, and another angle, maybe you see what I told to my daughter, uh, both of them, Say, uh, let's say uh, you, you love cooking. We love going to good restaurants. I will be afraid if I have a lean Six Sigma black belt master cook and chef because maybe it's not enough. Yeah. I prefer the cooking of my grandma. She does this, 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 this way. And it's awesome, right? Yeah. So it's all about emotions. So we have different kind of intelligence. Yeah, yeah, I love that. And that's where we can learn from nature as well. There's a podcast that I recorded that I don't know when it's coming out. I think it might be out this week. But it's run by some dyslexic dancers. It's all about um, neurodiversity. And what they're doing is amazing. All the podcasts are exploring the world beyond words. And there's a whole world beyond words. The fact that we don't have words for something doesn't mean it doesn't exist. That's what I always say to people is that nouns are human constructs. Nouns don't exist in nature. Nature has no language. It seems to be doing all right. It's it's never late. It seems to be hitting all of its measures. Yeah. Uh, but if you want to, to make a very good test about your ideas, you have to make projects in Beirut. Yeah. Uh, Ellie, it's great, no? Details, yeah. I made a couple there. It was so uh, you have to find your way in communication because you have three languages, not the quite understanding, a lack of focus. But lovely people and smart people, so uh, so you have to be absolutely creative. Yeah, yeah, and absolute chaos. <laughs> <laughs> so I just yeah. want to check how we're doing, because it's got up to thirty-seven degrees in here, which is why I'm starting to sweat a bit more. Um, do you want to carry on chatting? Do you want to do an experiment? Do you want to wrap up? I'm not attached to anything because I didn't have a plan to start with. Um, so we need to ask to Fatima Zara. What are you thinking? Um, I agree. <laughs> um, it means uh, uh, you don't know the question, but you agree with the answer? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, about the topic, um, I, I had a discussion with um, Steve, and actually, um, in this period, I'm interested in cognitive biases, and I think that it's when we, we are aware of them, it gave us some new area of growth. And this goes with the idea of trying the opposite because we are stuck with normality and stuck with standards. It's actually the, the meaning of thinking out of the box is thinking out of these norms of standards uh, which are keeping us stuck and limits our creativity. And I was sharing that I'm agile coach and I'm angry about frameworks. 
because frameworks just limit people's creativity and even there are some coaches that push in the frameworks to do a scrum by book do it this way and scrum is not the answer for everything it's actually the idea of the art of not knowing we don't know and just let's try and see and aspect and adapt yeah yeah yeah, there is in Agile. Is, uh, we there is a big challenge, and we are preparing an Agile retrospective twenty years after, with all the big guys, because to put everything on the plate, say hey, what's happening here, and um, and yes, because we have people saying coaches, but are more consultants. So I'm come to sell to implement. I guess we all know this, and then yeah, it's working. You're living, and nothing is working. And, and coaching is really to this style of thing. So let's say if you want to implement Scrum, doesn't mean you have to make a training, you make the setup and you roll out and you have to follow the line. That's a bit stupid. It's more likely an ongoing process that you're changing the routine of your work through this Scrum way of doing things. And, and another company is like, I, I love to reference La Presse, which is in Montreal. Montreal. Uh, I was very impressed what they're doing. They say they changed the way of um, agile teams are working, meaning you have the product owner, which is more the functional lead of, of the team. He's working directly with the customer or with the users. And his mission is not to gather requirement, is to understand the needs and to translate those needs into a vision. And then once the project is done, they document it and it's, streaming, it's going upstream to the company. So it's really going to this shop floor, a first line of activities. And you have to be a lot, very, very creative. And you have to think out of the box. You have to come with, because maybe your customer do not understand how you're speaking, and sometimes you're like, hey, draw me what you want. <laughs> Just you're drawing like kids. And because, and here is mentioning Dave Stone, they say, uh, drawing came before words in the evolution. And, and when you work in a company, in, 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 in a country where you don't speak the language, you have to, you can share this. And I learned this from the Middle East and the Arabic countries is getting close, socializing before doing the job is absolutely key. And what I understand with what you're doing, Steve, is helping this socializing aspect yeah. to create this boundary where humans and each, everyone try to do his best. Yeah. Lovely. Okay, I guess we can wrap up a little bit. Yes, my sense was, not only because I'm melting, I need to see my family, <laughs> my sense was that feels like enough for now. Um, the thing I was going to, you, a couple of people mentioned this whole idea of out of the box thinking. It's another thing that I, I like to challenge. There's nothing wrong with it. I always say before you go looking outside the box, have you looked everywhere in the box? So it tends to, it's a really gestalt thing. It's like, I bet, in the same way that we want to explore space and there's so much of the earth we haven't explored, we want to explore the world and there's so much of our bodies we don't know. It's like before you go looking out of the box, check, check inside the box because I bet what you're looking for is already in there. <laughs> That's a good point. Yeah. Maybe sometimes when you think you are thinking out of the box, you are still inside, but in another area you haven't seen. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's it's been lovely to chat with you. All. You fill me with, I, like I say, I, everyone that I've met, and it's probably my little bubble in the agile world, um, all around the people that Pierre knows and various others. It fills me with hope because my my worry was that it was this very fixed or sort of dogmatic systematic thing but it's lovely to see there's human beings at the heart of it and um yeah being revolutionary so it's lovely uh, not not here not here uh, i just invite people i like yeah. so it's Which absolutely selfish <laughs> when because uh, dave snowden shared my 10-year plan my final story when i published it in january so it went to a lot of that community I got so many messages from people telling me how to make it more efficient. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you 
guys aren't like that, which is lovely. So no, thank you, thank you so much for having me. I will send you the slides with these things on it. I will send you some stuff that I've mentioned, but keep in touch. It's it was my pleasure having you, and thank you all, guys. And this is also your place. And the next time will be in two weeks, and we'll have one guy from Montreal. We'll have Claude Demont. So guys, I thank you so much. Um, I will share the chat in the meetup group, so you can see all the conversation.